Hello and welcome back to Liar. We'll be continuing where we left off, which, if you recall, is after Richter had a little conversation with the little king, the new king, pr the prince, well, not even the prince anymore, um, Andreas. Basically, Andreas taking it out on Lyle and Richter. And understandably so, because the prime suspect is Richter. And everyone knows that Lyle is getting a little too close to him. So, you know, he's understandably mad. But he's acting like a child. But yeah. Um... Also, Richter is already using his powers a little more, or I, I guess he's practicing more, and he's still trying to figure out what um, what happened with the king, and he was able to see into the king's memories, or actually, no, into the queen's memories, and he saw a vision of the king when he was younger, and then also a very young uh, prince. And, yeah. So, I'm assuming... There's going to be some time difference in which Richter has studied up a bit more. And since uh, the new king, Andreas, basically forbade uh, Lyle from being able to see Richter, he had um, Leif basically deliver him a message. And I'm assuming Leif is going to end up being the messenger boy now. But also, uh, Leif has some suspicions about Richter that he might actually be the, um... I forgot what he was trying to call him, like the Avatar or something like that for, um... the god of this particular story of Liar. And, um... So obviously, he's right on the money, but... Um... Richter is want to keep it... You know, he wants to keep it under wraps. So he's like, no, I don't know what that is. Uh, yeah, you, you know, that that sounds crazy, but um, because it was kind of advice to him that you don't, you probably don't want to do that, dude. You know, you know, be careful. I don't, I don't think you want to reveal that. So they're keeping it under wraps for now. But anyways, um, well, let's continue and you know, see where this story is going to go. Chapter 9, Day 24 It doesn't feel like I got much sleep as I'd hoped. I slowly wake up, sliding my legs off the gritty stone bench. The cold floor of the cell sends a shock through my body, but I'm too exhausted to jolt up from my relaxed position. One would think that I would be used to this by now, but I don't think I'll ever get used to it. Waking up like this isn't normal for me at all, and it will definitely take some getting used to. It could definitely be worse, though. I'm positive that it's way colder out there than it is in here. It's weird waking up and not hearing birds chirping or anything like that. There's almost no sound outside of the window. The wind is absent and I can't hear any of the trees rustling. If I pay close attention, I can hear a little bit of commotion coming from the city. Everyone must be doing their daily routine. I imagine Eden is getting ready for the day and making a racket, getting all of his commissions prepared. Charlotte is probably getting her day started at the bakery too, prepping all kinds of food. John is most likely learning more things from her about the trade, or just making sure that the kitchen doesn't fall apart. Thinking about this causes my stomach to twist and shrink. I'm surprised I even remember their names. I only met and talked with them a few minutes. Usually I forget someone's name the second that they tell me, but this is different. Here in Lyre, everyone is so much more interesting and unique. Nobody feels like another face in the crowd. I guess it's because I'm not used to living here. I sit up and slouch over, staring at the floor. My reflection stares back at me and I sigh. I wonder what they think of me now. They probably believe that I really did kill the king. I feel awful if I ever had to look at them in the face again. Visions of those nobles staring at me with disgusted faces on the winter solstice suddenly invade my mind. Too many people here hide behind a smile. I can't say the same for the villagers in the city, but I felt more comfortable around them. Even if I enjoy what I do, I feel like I'm constantly around the wrong crowd. Sometimes I wonder what it would be like just to walk away from all of it. 
go live somewhere nice and quiet amongst people who are simple and kind. I don't really know what I would do, but being away from all of this would be enough for me. I definitely want to get out more. Probably take early walks in the crisp morning air. Richter. Their voice causes me to jump a bit, and my body leans back against the wall in a stiff manner. I really wish you wouldn't scare me like that. Sorry, I was getting tired of listening to you ramble. I really hate the fact that they can hear everything I think, but I've slowly realized that there's no use in complaining. I wish that they'd share the same sentiment. You should get used to it. Believe me, I thought I was. Their snarky tone makes me roll my eyes in a tired way, which is something I hope that they can see. I hear them chide me in a deep voice. You should really start practicing. The thought of practicing using my mind's eye makes me wish I could go back to sleep, even on this hard bed. I just woke up. Could you give me a minute? Right. Of course. As taxing as it is, practicing with a mind's eye is one of the few ways I can cure boredom while I'm in this cell. In here, I can use it as a form of escapism. I can go to all of these different places and have all of these different experiences. I can't really allow myself to get too carried away with it though. I have to remember my main goal. I have to practice so that I can be strong enough to see into the more recent past. I need to use it to see who killed Raynar. It seems impossible given that the trial could come out of nowhere. Not only that, but just knowing who the killer is won't save me. I need to use that knowledge to prove my innocence. Most importantly, I need to use it to prove who did it and have them face justice. I'll need time to think and figure it out. Relay information to people that can help. I can't do all of this the day before the trial. If only I could see Lyle. He would be so much help with that. I stand up from my sitting position and begin to pace around the cell, careful to step on the dry ground. Now that I think about it, I've been practicing a lot. Maybe I could try figuring out who'd killed Raynar. There's no harm in trying, I guess. Wrong. Another abrupt word from Tigrin causes me to stop in my tracks. There is a severe amount of harm in trying. How? I'm going to have to try eventually, aren't I? You just need to trust me. You aren't ready yet. Something like that takes a lot of practice, skill, and focus. With luck, you'll be able to get to that point in time. But until then, you need to start smaller. Hearing them say all of this angers me slightly. I've trusted them so far, but I always have this feeling in the back of my head that they're hiding something from me. They probably know that this is how I feel, but I'm not about to bring it up with them. The fact that they can't tell me everything makes me even angrier. It doesn't seem right. I let out a sigh of defeat. Fine. I'll trust you, but you'd better not give me a reason not to. I can try. I sit down on the floor, crossing my legs and slouching over. They always have to have the last word, I guess. Staring into one of the puddles, I can see the reflection of the window. Dim sunlight shines into the room, giving everything a chilling glow. Is there anything in particular that I should start with? That's your choice, but I would try to be a bit more... imaginative. Lately, your visions have been a bit too personal. They've also been based off of recent experiences or confrontations. And there's something wrong with that? Somewhat. You need to truly try and test your boundaries. Reach out beyond the horizon and take a hold of a memory or feeling. It could be an experience you've always wanted to have or something lived by someone you met a long time ago. Something near and dear to your heart. They pause to take a breath. Or something new. Visions like this, they're like fuel for my avatars. I press my finger into the dirt on the floor and draw a line. Is there a reason why that happens? It just helps. I wipe the dirt off my finger and lean back. <sighs> okay, I'll try. I feel a warmth run through my body as I relax and concentrate. I try to think about home. The sunny days and tall, white towers. The rolling hills by the cliffs and sandy shores. Waves crashing against the stone walls of the docks. 
all the people who made an impact on my life. Memories of the past and the things I've done. Sitting in the chair by the window with my mother, just talking with her. Watching the ships sail by. After a few seconds of closing my eyes and thinking about all of these things, I feel as if I'm pulled away from my own body. I get the sense that there's chaos all around me, yet for some reason, my body can't feel a thing. I also feel like I'm floating. Or, it's what I think it would feel like. It's truly indescribable. That feeling quickly fades as I'm thrown into a perilous scene. A flash of lightning obscures my vision for a moment as everything unfolds. Heavy rain swirls around me as the sound of harsh wind drowns my senses. It looks like I'm spectating the scene of a ship at sea surrounded by a terrible storm. Waves crash into the sides of the small ship and sailors clamor around the deck. Some of them are being thrown all over the place by waves crashing onto the surface and flooding over the sides. Most of the sails have been rolled up as well. The ship looks old, too. It's nothing like the ones I see coming in and out of the harbor and Erin. It almost looks archaic. However, my body seems to be tethered to a single sailor. He's a monkey with light fur that looks like it's been bleached by the sun. His skin is a dark pink color, too. He's swinging around one of the ropes tied to a mast, looking around at every going on around him. His eyes are bright as golden as the sun. I'm not really sure what's going on or what I'm witnessing, but I get this feeling that I can't look away. His tail curls tightly around the rope as his eyes dart ahead into the eye of the storm. He's panting heavily and keeps looking around at what's going on with worry in his eyes. There's a coiled rope being held by his foot. I always thought that it was cool that monkeys could do that as well. Lightning strikes again and the boom echoes throughout the deep abyss of the open ocean, casting a bright light among the clouds and across the rolling oak surface of the ocean. One of the sailors from below yells up towards the mast. Alverton! Get down from there! It's not safe! The monkey looks down at him and yells back in a bellowing voice. It's my job! You'll thank me if we go overboard! He gestures to the rope being held by his foot. Just keep her going steady and make sure you don't lose track of the eye. Aye, we've got that covered. The wave crashes over the side and the sailor staggers a bit, but keeps a hold on the railing. And the sailor yells out among the crew. We should have never listened to you, you know. It's not safe to go out this far from home. We should never have left the shores. Alverton looks down with an annoyed face. Save the lecture for wearing the clear, would you? It'll be worth it in the end with the haul we've made. As far as I know, that haul you speak of it probably fell overboard not too long ago. And I don't feel like joining it. Alverton tightens his grip on the rope and looks ahead with a determined gaze. Just a bit further. He says this to himself, making it hard for me to hear. I float around a bit more, not really having control of the direction I'm going, but staying within a general distance of his figure. It's like I'm some sort of spirit. This is really weird. I thought I was supposed to experience these things from the perspective of others. Why am I not in the body right now? Tigerin told me to test my boundaries, but I'm not sure if this has anything to do with what's happening. All of the visions I've willingly had so far have been about people I've had some experience with. Yet I feel some sort of connection with this monkey, even though I don't know him. Could he be a sailor from Erin that I've run into before? It doesn't seem likely given how old the ship looks, but it's the only explanation that I can come up with. I snap out of my thoughts and go back to focusing on the scene playing out before me. He grips a simple looking necklace that's tied around his neck on a string. Then it happens. There's this moment where everything seems calm. The noise from the rain is muffled and the wind slows down slightly. A deafening boom claps all around me, and my vision goes away in an instant. Did lightning just strike the ship? My hearing comes back after a second as wind whistles through my ears. I get this false sense of dropping, like I'm being dragged down by a heavy object. Or maybe it's like I'm taking a dive through the air, chasing something. Then there's a heavy splash and a sudden decrease in speed. All the noise is muffled, and it's almost eerily soothing. 
like closing a window on a rainy night. My eyes adjust to the darkness and I can see little particles floating around me, like dust swirling through the air. The ocean. I'm under the water's surface. I get a glimpse of the monkey's figure off in the distance. Lightning in the sky above dimly illuminates the water around us, casting rays of light that beam down into the dark void beneath us. He's just floating there, his body completely still. The rope that was being gripped by his foot is gone, probably lost to the tide or still on the ship. I try to get closer to him, but I don't feel like I'm moving. I'm not liking where this is going. I can hear this ominous vibrating noise, like an earthquake, but underwater. Ominous voices and noises echo around me. Fear creeps its way into my soul as I wait in darkness. I jolt in my seated position, painfully throwing myself into the wall behind me, letting out a yelp. What's going on in there? The guard yells down the tunnel, sounding like he's pretty close. Nothing, I just slipped. I'm fine. There's a pause, then he throws his voice down the tunnel again. Just don't do it again. I hear his footsteps travel back up the corridor, and I stand up, resting my head near the window. Are you going to say something or do I have to ask? I quickly whisper this under my breath in an annoyed tone. There's silence. It's a very long silence and at first I think they don't hear me. Then they speak up. There are just some things that I am not allowed to explain to you. What the hell was that? Who was that? And why were you there? More silence. Look, I've been nice so far. I've been going along with all of this knowing that I could very well be in a lot of trouble. The least that you can do is be truthful with me. This gets them to speak up. I am being truthful with you. It doesn't really feel like it. I hear them take a deep breath. Richter, please. I've already explained all of this before. I am held back from doing certain things. Saying certain things. It could cause a lot of trouble. It's not my place to give you knowledge, only the ability to seek it out yourself. I grip one of the rusty iron bars in my fist, running my other hand down my face. A little bit more facial hair prickles my hand than usual, reminding me how long I've gone without taking care of myself. I'll probably have a fully grown beard by the end of this. You just need to trust me. I grip the bars on the window harder. I'm really tired of hearing you say that. I have several reasons not to. Forgive me for being irrational, although I don't really see it that way, but you've been nothing but suspicious. And you think I want to be? I don't know, but none of this is working in your favor. That book Leif brought down said that people who have your power die. Is that what's going to happen to me? Are you really just here to escort me into an early grave? No, I'm not. Who's Alverton? More silence as I ignore my question and try to change the subject. All will be revealed, I promise. Is he a past avatar? Someone whose mind you invaded long ago? You know that I can't answer that. What were you doing there? There's a deep sigh and more silence. I really don't want to believe it, but it feels like you're lying to me about something. Something really important. They don't answer. That's when I hear footsteps pacing down the tunnel. They're light and sturdy sounding, like they're walking very fast. I back away from the window and sit on the ground in front of the door, leaning my back against the rough wall. We'll talk about this later. I say this under my breath so that whoever is coming doesn't hear me. It's a tough game I play, talking with Tigerin while I have no privacy. The guards can't really hear my hushed whispers from here though, so it works for now. I could speak with them in my mind, but it takes a lot of getting used to. The footsteps get closer and I can't help but get a little anxious. Hopefully it's not Andreas again, down here to patronize me even more than he already has. Their repetitive noise doesn't sound like his hooves, though. It's a sound that, that I'm all too familiar with. The sound of someone wearing shoes. The steps slow to a casual walk, and then she comes into view. 
Liz stands there in front of the cell door, looking at me. She has this face that looks like she's trying to find what to say. Mm, you look a lot better than I thought you would. Thanks. Sorry. It's just the way Prince Andreas described you. He exaggerated a bit. King Andreas. Yes. And how is our king? She gives me a perplexed look. I can't tell if she's surprised I'm showing any hint of concern, or if she's shocked that I have the gall to mock him in front of her. He's obviously distraught and finds his own way to cope with it. But that's the thing. It's like he's still a prince. Nothing really has changed yet. Yet. She throws her head back in an exhausted manner and runs her hands through her auburn hair. Why am I talking about this with you? I don't even know you, and you're suspected of killing our king. She leans back against the wall and looks down. I know that Lyle tried to convince you that I didn't do it. He also said that you even considered it. What of it? Well, for the record, I didn't do it. She cocks an eyebrow at that remark. But why would you believe me? She throws her hands to her sides and looks at me incredulously. I don't believe you. I believe Lyle. He's extremely loyal to this kingdom, and I know that he would never betray it. Even if he let his feelings get in the way. So if he trusts you, then that gives me reason to at least consider it as a possibility. Well, that's very nice to hear. Sadly, I don't think it will help me. She lowers her head and exhales. Why have you come down here? She slumps against the wall slightly. The first reason? I was curious. The whole situation seems completely outlandish and I had to see for myself at least once before the trial. What's the second reason? She lets out a sigh. The trial. Has a day already been decided? Yes. The trial will take place nine days from now. Nine days? I jolt up from my sitting position. No, 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 no. I know. Andreas wants it to happen as soon as possible. This is just enough time for everything to be prepared, so it's quite literally happening as soon as possible. I'm really sorry, but I thought you should know. I walk over to the stone bed and sit on it, leaning against the wall and looking up at the ceiling. Liz is no longer in my sight, but I can still feel and hear her presence on the other side of the bars. Are you okay? I don't answer her at first. You remember how I said that Raynar spoke very highly of you? Yes. She takes a deep breath. That was an understatement. He saw something in you that even I can't explain. I hear her take a couple of steps away. If you truly didn't kill Raynar, then don't take that for granted. She pauses waiting for a response from me, but I don't give her one. My mind is racing with the idea that I only have nine days to figure this out. What she said about Raynar resonates with me, though. Take care of yourself, Lord Richter. She walks down the tunnel, her footsteps fading away. After a while, silence fills the tunnel once more. The trial is only in nine days away, and I have nothing to help me yet. Lyle's forbidden from seeing me, so I can't get his help either. I can't train any faster, and it feels like I'm getting nowhere. Visions of Raynar cloud my mind as well. The thought of his true murderer never being unveiled makes me feel empty inside for some reason. Every possibility of that night's outcome swirls in my head, like a hurricane. Only one thought stays focused in the center of the storm, though. How could I have prevented this from happening. What the hell am I going to do? Only one option comes to mind. I need to at least try to figure out who actually killed him. It's the only way that I can solve this in time. What did I tell you earlier? Tigran, I only have nine days. Even you understand that it would take a miracle to get out of this, including the one that I already have. You need more practice. I have to try, Tigran. If I can't figure this out in time, I'm dead. You're not going to stop me from making this decision. I sit down on the floor and cross my legs. Closing my eyes, I can hear their voice get louder. Richter, I'm warning you. If you do this, you'll what? A chill runs down my spine. After I cut him off, he stops talking altogether. Then he speaks up in a soft tone. I 
will not do anything. You, however, will regret this. For a moment, I considered their advice. Only for a moment, though. For the past five minutes, my life feels like it's rushed to a sudden stop. I'm at the top of the figurative stairs, and in front of me lies the inevitable. Sorry, Tigran, but I'm not risking my life on this. It's now or never. The entire presence of the cell implodes as I succumb to the feeling of the void. At first, there's nothing. It's like I'm sleeping. Suddenly, the sharp pains erupt throughout my body. Blow after blow sends me into a whirl of agony. My body feels like it's being ripped through all of reality as I know it. It's almost indescribable. My very existence is being torn in two as I delve into the past. Then I'm falling. The black void doesn't let up as I'm thrown to the hard floor. I get the feeling of recovering from falling out of bed, but it's a hundred times worse. This is all accompanied by loud, crashing sounds. My whole body ruptures in on itself. The blurry darkness fades away as my eyes flicker open. Did it work? I feel like I'm slumped up against something, and I can only see the window and a bit of the wall. I'm definitely in Raynar's body. I don't really get this time to assess my surroundings as terrible pain strikes through my body. Nothing else matters in that moment as my entire being is filled with all kinds of emotions and feelings. It's like someone took my insides and crushed them in their hands. My soul feels like it wants to cave in on itself, but the body I'm in just lays there. I can feel some sense of Raynar trying to get up, but that overwhelming sense of emotions and pain clouds that. Fear, anger, shock, sadness. Not to mention the unbearable suffering that works through my body like a writhing snake. It's a hot, searing pain, like someone's holding a torch to my chest. I can feel the blood rushing down my chest in a thick, heavy stream. I've been cut and gashed before, but this is nothing like that. I want it to stop, but I can't let that happen. As much as I want this to be over with right now, I have to see it through to the end. If I could feel my own heart, I'm sure that it would be racing in my chest. Raynar's it certainly is. With every single beat, I can feel more blood gush out of the wounds in his torso. It's agonizing, but I need to keep going. Everything seems normal so far. Nothing twisted or blurry. It all feels as accurate as it could be on that night. He struggles to lift himself into a sitting position, but only manages to turn his head. He's letting out several pained gasps and sounds, like he's trying to say something, but it only comes out in mumbled noises. It's devastating. I can't help but feel sorry for him. And yet, a deeper feeling eats away at my own thoughts. Something worse than sorrow. He didn't deserve to die like this. His vision falters for a moment, but he manages to stay conscious. Outside the window, snow whirls by, wind beating against the glass. The shimmering auras on the horizon peeks through the stormy clouds and casts an ominous green moonlit throughout the room. In that emerald light, I see them. A figure in dark and shiny leather cloak approaches from the foot of the bed. The hood casts a shadow over their face so that I can't quick out make out who they are. They have to show their face at some point though, so I hold on. They slowly walk towards the body slumped on the floor in front of them. They're covered in blood all over the front of their body and brandishing a long pointed dagger. It's the exact dagger from that night. Seeing the weapon that caused these wounds makes them hurt even more. The gnarled shape of the blade would make even the strongest man writhe in agony. Blood runs down to the base of the blade and then drips past the guard and onto the floor in front of them in dark puddles. None of the blood seems to be seeping into the clothing. It just flows right off in thick streams. They hold the tip of the blade close to their face as if looking at it, though I can't know for sure. Their hands start to shake slightly, but steadies as they turn and look at Raynar. I can't even see their eyes, but I can feel their vision piercing into my soul. Another strange thing is the fact that the curtains are flowing like there's a light breeze, but the window isn't open. The pain that was once bearable is now slowly beginning to numb as I feel Raynar's body lose its hold on life. The feeling is terrible and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. His vision is beginning to become more and more blurried 
eyelids wavering. Lightning strikes outside the window and I get a glimpse of their face illuminated in the contrasting light for just a moment. It's not enough to be able to tell who they are, but my eyes are slowly adjusting to the darkness. Their face looked human from what I saw. There it is again. It's a male human. I'm certain of it. Not only that, but they look familiar too. But... No. That's even more strange. I don't think I've met a human male in Liar. Not well enough to recognize one for that matter. Something about this isn't right. It's hard to think with this excruciating pain shooting through my body and all of the emotions overwhelming my senses. As I focus on trying to reorient myself, Raynar's eyes finally adjust to the darkness of the room. What I see next is true horror. No. It's... me. I almost don't want to believe it. I don't even want to see it. But there I am, staring back at myself. I'd say it's like looking in a mirror, but it's far from it. Because when he stares back, he only sees a deer. And I can see it on his face. My face. This can't be real. He has a cold and analyzing gaze. Eyes shining a tense green. His warm skin looks pale in the dim moonlight. This isn't right. I know I didn't kill Raynar. This vision is wrong. Tigerin was right. I should have listened to them. Raynar's eyes finally give up, and I feel his body being drained of its life. I can't see anything, but I'm still there. The scene marches on around me. The doppelganger's presence moves behind Raynar, and then he's lifted up and forward by his antler. I feel something cold being pressed to his neck. Then it drags across the fur and skin, going deeper and deeper. A scorching hot pain overwhelms my throat, followed by a sharp and unbearable jolt. No! My mind is torn out of Raynar, and I'm back in the cell. I'm laying on the ground in a fetal position, tears streaming down my face. They soak the ground beneath my head, and a bit of mud sticks to my face as I lift myself up. The pain in my chest is gone, but my heart is still racing. The only thing that hurts now is my head. It's several times worse than any of the more recent headaches. A constant pounding against the side of my head, like someone's banging rocks against it. Are you okay? Why would they ask that? They already know how I feel. <sighs> I'll be fine. Are you sure? I don't answer and I hear them sigh. Richter, I tried to tell you. No, you're... You were right. I get up and brush myself off. Cold dirt sticks to my clothes. I'm still shaking all over. I'm sorry for not listening. I sit down on the corner of the bed by the window. I saw everything. That was horrible. I can tell that they're trying to pick their words carefully as they continue to speak. The past hurts. You know that better than most considering your first real experience with the vision. I think back to the scene playing out with the Queen's death as Raynar lays there, helpless to stop it. An assassin with a dagger taking life for some unknown reason. What you just did, I've seen it drive most men insane. Or close to the edge, so to say. I feel insane. You're not. I'm honestly surprised. Your vision, it was clearer than I thought it would be. I get into a sitting position. Not clear enough. Do you know? It's hard to form the words after everything that's just happened. Yes? Do you know why I was the assassin? Does it mean anything? They take a few seconds to form an answer. It doesn't mean anything. It's just your own mind playing tricks on you. Or, could it be that you feel guilty for his death? They say those last few words with a bit of carefulness in their voice. It's not that I feel completely guilty, I just... I think back to the night when it all happened. Raynar said that he wanted to see me in his chambers later. I didn't really think about it too much, 
so I went off and spent the rest of the night with Lyle. Then I got a bit carried away. When the servant was sent for me, I took my sweet time getting ready, and when I got there, it was already too late. I just wonder sometimes. If I had gotten there a bit earlier, I might have been able to do something about it. I know. You've been suppressing this feeling for quite some time. It's not your fault, though. What happened can't be changed, and it can't be helped. You just need to focus on what's to come. You're right. I just need to do what I can to fix this mess. Make sure the future isn't as dark. That reminds me. Before I can ask them anything, I become more aware of the sound of armor clanking together. It sounds like a guard is pacing around the tunnel. Hang on. I don't want any more interruptions. I close my eyes and concentrate. Then within seconds, I'm in my mind's eye. Come out, Ty. I haven't been called that in a long time. I won't call you that if you don't want me to. Richter. I could care less what you call me. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Of course. You know that book Leif showed me? Yes. It said something about your purpose. Something about how you're here to guide everyone to a brighter future. Yes, it did say something about that. What of it? Is it true that you know what's going to happen? In the future. They take their paw and brush it along the scales of their arm, giving it some thought. In a way, yes. But it's a bit more complicated than that. How so? Think of it like this. They place their finger on one of the scales on their arm. You believe that there is a single future that can be altered depending on choices made in the present, correct? I suppose. Well, that's not entirely true. With this, they slightly lift the scale, making the others in the front of it lift up a bit as well. There are many possible futures. They're all playing out separately from each other, and every single one is different from the last one in some way. The scales on their arm begin to bristle and create waves across the surface. It's mesmerizing. Each prediction and every decision leads to another, creating the flow of time. One future is not entirely discarded, but simply forgotten. These futures cannot be predicted long term, however. They guide their hand over their head, as if gesturing to all of these different realities. We can never truly tell which future will come to be or which event is going to take place. We'll never know if it's true until it happens. We? They look with their arm and gaze down at me with a disturbed look. Referring to mankind. Right. Does my future look bright? They let out another sigh. If I could tell you, I would. But sadly, I can't. That's why you have to trust me. I still don't like how much you hide from me. Even when you don't have to. They take a long, deep breath before speaking. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. I'm trying to protect you. From what? From everything. You're protecting me from everything? Richter, I've been doing this for countless years. And I've had a long time to make many mistakes. A lot of mistakes. A pair of their arms hang limp to their side. Gods aren't perfect, Richter. And I'm the best example. I take a few steps closer to their towering form so that I can get a bit closer. Yes, but you've done a lot more good than bad, right? They look at me with a downhearted gaze. Of course, but that can never make up for all of it. Their chest heaves and they relax a bit. This is what it is, Richter. This is what it is to be a god. They are sheep and you are the shepherd. Except there is no wolf. Only the sheep. And you sit there trying to stop the rams from killing each other. To no avail. For only a moment, I catch a glimpse of sadness in their eyes. It quickly fades away, however. I never thought of it like that. It's just the way things are. Us gods can only help from the shadows. We cannot interfere 
with the mortal's affairs too much. Tigran, may I ask you a question? Their smile turns into a wary frown. Yes. I will try to be as open as I can with you. Who is Alverton? As the name slips from my mouth, I see their eyes stare off into space. They shake their heads slightly and answer. If you truly must know, I feel it is only fair given that you were able to unearth that vision to begin with. Not only that, but I was the one who pushed you to try for something a bit new. Their arms wave to and fro as if at this point they're talking to themselves. Then they look down and clear their throat, beginning to speak. You've heard the name before, have you not? It's an old name, but yes, I have. There is an island not too far south from where you currently are. Alverton Isle. To the east is Grimrock. Yes. The island was named after him. Over a thousand years ago. A thousand years? I didn't want to believe it at first, but it all makes sense. To think that I can see that far into the past. Was I right earlier? Is Alverton one of your avatars? A thoughtful look glazes over their eyes. Alverton was the first... He was my first avatar. What were you doing in that vision? They crossed their arms. Instead of asking questions, just let me tell you what I know I can. Okay. They lower their arms and continue with a slight sigh. He was not only my first avatar, but the introduction to my existence. I would have done anything for him. Even considering he's the reason... The reason for what? This is why I don't like to tell stories. Their face is frozen as they whisper this under their breath, but they continue. Nothing. The point is, you have a lot to thank them for. And a lot to learn from them. I believe it to be beneficial for you to study their past. Study their past? Shouldn't I be focusing on studying Raynar's past? Of course. But when you find the time... I would suggest that you look into his past. The mind's eye starts to slowly fade around me. Wait, I just have two more questions. Yes. First, when I was seeing into Alverton's past, I wasn't viewing it from his perspective. I was just floating around him like a ghost. Is that because he too was an avatar? Tigrin places a hand under their chin with an impressed look. Very good observation. Yes, that is the reason. And my last question. Would it be better if I try to see that knight through the killer's perspective? They tilt their heads slightly and raise a hand. No. It would be even more difficult. You know King Raynar was killed on that night, so it's easier to envision it. But you don't know who the killer was. Trying to see a vision of that would be much harder. You'll learn that... This applies to most visions of the past that are so recently laid out on the flow of time. That makes sense. Another reason I'm regretting that proposal is the fact that I'm not very eager to play out that scene of killing Raynar, even if I'm not the one doing it. Okay, I think I'm ready to leave now. I need to rest after everything that's just happened. They nod. Very well. I'll leave you with some advice before you go. Your only limit is your mind. Before I can respond to their bit of advice, they disappear. With that, the mind's eye closes in around me. And just like that, I'm back in the cold yet hot and humid cell. The sun is still high in the sky and there isn't a cloud in sight. The clanking sound of armor that I'm remember hearing before seems to be getting louder. Whoever it is, they're getting closer. It's weird coming out of the mind's eye with not a single second of time passed. A guard rounds the corner and drops a tray to the floor. It's not high enough to mess up the meal, but it still rattles around. Here's your food. There's a wooden cup of water and a bowl of porridge. A piece of parchment placed on the tray slowly drifts to the floor and lands in a puddle. The guard lightly kicks the tray so that it slides underneath the barred off door. The guard laughs to himself slowly as he walks away towards the entrance of the dungeons. 
I rise from my seat and go to pick it up. Water drips from it, but it's still legible. Before I can even read the letter, my eyes glance down to see who it's signed by. Seeing his pretty handwriting messily thrown onto the paper fills me with a warm feeling. Just words of assurance are enough to make me smile in this lonely cell. What I would give to have him down here with me. He would take off all that cold armor and hold me against his warm body. I'd sleep much better if that were the case. As I walk over to the pile of hay where I like to store things, I remember the medicine Leif gave me. My head is still aching from that nightmare of an experience from earlier. I slide the letter into the pile and pull out the small vial of pellets. I pull out the cork and pop one in my mouth. It has a sour taste, but I quickly swallow it down using the cup of water. I'm not very hungry right now, so I just walk over to my bed and lie down. I need to rest my head for just a bit. What happened earlier took everything out of me. Thinking about it won't do me any good right now. Once I wake up, I'll figure it out. Before I know it, I'm fast asleep. And yet, my eyes haven't felt like they've been closed in a long time. They still don't. To be continued. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> okay, so that was um, the most current update for Liar, which was smaller than the other ones, but not, you know, that short. And I knew it was going to be small because I saw Matt Max tweet about it, that he said that it was going to be short. So that's why I decided to record it right now <laughs> um, before I end up getting busy and I won't be able to do it until Thursday. Obviously, yeah, this is Wednesday. So, uh, what'd you guys think? Admittedly, I did go through the files before I started it to see if there was any new CGs or whatever, or like a new character introduced or whatever. I, I do that with every single visual novel that I can, if only to block out nudity. Uh, but yeah, so I saw the image and I originally thought that it was a female. I was like, oh, it's that one girl I, whose name I completely forgot already, even though she showed up at the beginning of this um, video. <laughs> um, but I originally thought it was going to be her. And I'm like, oh, it's her. I knew it. It's her. But then, you know, reading this, I'm like, oh, wait, it's not her. You're actually not really seeing the, me the complete memory yet. Um, but yeah. Also, I was surprised to see the monkey, and then I also saw the the CG with the monkey talking to um, Tigran. I'm like, huh, what's going on here? But now that I have context about it, it's interesting. It's actually even more interesting than I, what I initially thought in my head, which was that he's contacting someone else while this is happening. That this is actually all from the past. And there's a fighter jet right now flying over here. Fucking... Navy base. Anyways, so, um, it's interesting that we got to see, I guess, yeah, because witness, see the first avatar. And I'm assuming that looking through his memories of the past, that Richter will be get some advice on how to go about his um vision quest so to speak um in trying to figure out who killed the the king well the, the late king um because if he's the first one that means that he is the one that also had to go through this for the first time so it's probably better to have experience from somebody who's also technically going through it like you you know learning from learning from their mistakes and stuff mm. but yeah so what are your thoughts um who do you think actually did it i'm assuming and i actually do think that it, that it did make sense that he wasn't prepared yet so when he had the vision he saw his face on the killer's body because as far as he's concerned, he's the one that did it. He's not actually seeing what he needs to see. He's seeing what he thinks in his heart is what happened, which is that he basically, um, 
he could have prevented the death had he, had he not, you know, gone with Lyle and, you know, did the nasty and then taken his time to get up to the tower. He might have prevented it from happening. Or he might have at least um, not prevented the initial attack, but, you know, prevented, you know, what would have caused the death of the king. But yeah. And I am curious if there's more that we haven't seen yet that um, Tigran is hiding. Well, not hiding, that he is not at liberty to disclose. And I'm actually curious if Richter uncovers something that he's not supposed, that Tigran is not supposed to tell Richter, if then he is allowed to explain it. Like right there where, um, when the monkey appeared, at first he was like, no, 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 I can't tell you, I can't tell you. But then later on he's like, well, okay, fine. Since you already saw this vision, I guess I can tell you. Like, if there will be instances where it'll be like, yeah, I can't tell you, I can tell you. But then if Richter is able to get a vision of that at least, to get some some basis for what he's asking, if uh, Tigran is then able to actually elaborate on it, because they're like, well, he already knows about this, he already knows who this person is, or he, he already saw them, so, you know, the cat's out of the bag. And then that's sort of like a loophole for his restrictions. But yeah, again, write down your thoughts. And... Well, I guess that's it for now, and thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play a liar yourself, you can find it over on Itch, and you can find a direct link to it from the creator's Twitter page, which is Sky Peanut, which I will link down in the description. Or you could uh, subscribe to the Patreon and get uh, early access to Builds of Liar and help support the project, which will be very much appreciated, I'm sure. And, well, I guess that's it for now, and I will see you guys in the next videos. Bye-bye.